Welcome to A-Minder, a podcast where we summarize the latest publications on neurodegenerative disease research so that you can stay up to date with the newest findings. Every month, our team of scientists will sort and organize the titles into themes and present shortened versions of the abstracts. We'll make sure to mention the title, the journal, the first author, and the last author for each publication. Whether you're in the lab, on the bus, or cooking your meal, we hope you find this podcast helpful. Hi, my name is Marcia, and I will be your host for the section Genetic Landscape. There are a total of 42 papers in this section for this month, and in the interest of time, in this episode, we will only cover papers related to peace and studies, APOE, amyloid beta-related mutations, novel variants, and end with papers on other variants or mutations. Let's first begin with the papers related to PSEN. The first paper is titled, Pathogenic PSEN 1, Threonin 119 isoleucine mutation in two Korean patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease. This paper is by first author Beginsky and last author Kim, published in the journal Diagnostics. The investigators in this study report a probable pathogenic threonin 119 isoleucine mutation, which I'll refer to as the threonin mutation for the rest of this summary, and PSEN1 in two unrelated early onset Alzheimer's disease Korean patients. While both patients suffered from memory-associated issues, they presented some differences in terms of age of onset of memory decline, signs of atrophy, and the uptake pattern of the tracer by 18F fludeoxyglucose positron emission tomography. Using targeted next-generation sequencing and Sanger sequencing, the group identified a heterozygous C to T exchange in PSN1 exon 5. The resultant threonine mutation may contribute to a significant change inside the HL1 loop in which it is located. This conserved loop is associated with several Alzheimer's disease-related mutations, and the threonine mutation may thus have a role in disease progression. The title of the next paper is Presenilin 1 and APP gene mutations in early onset AD families from a southeast region of China. The first and last authors are Zhao and Peng, and the paper was published in the journal Current Alzheimer's Research. The aim of this study was to investigate the spectrum of PSN1, PSN2, and amyloid precursor protein, or APP, gene mutations in early onset familial Alzheimer's disease patients in the Chinese population. For this, the investigators performed whole exome sequencing and described relevant clinical features in patients with early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. They identified a splice mutation in PSN1 and a missense mutation in APP. Based on their results, they concluded that the variant in PSN1 in the Chinese cohort revealed different clinical phenotypes when compared with that of Europeans. The next paper in this category is titled Identification of a Pathogenic PSN1 Mutation Associated with Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease. It was published in the journal Current Alzheimer's Research. The first author of this paper is Zhao and the last author is Kim. For this study, the researchers report on a 40-year-old patient who presented with progressive memory decline and was diagnosed with early onset AD. They tried to find possible mutations through whole exome sequencing and identified a pathogenic mutation in PSN1 or pathogenic alanine 285 valine mutation. It is located in the random coil structure of PSN1 and could result in extra stress in this region. Further, they observed mild left temporal lobe atrophy via MRI. Using PET, they find and report hypometabolism in the bilateral, temporal, and parietal lobes, as well as increased amyloid deposition in bilateral, frontal, parietal, temporal lobes. They concluded that in vivo studies are needed to evaluate the role of this pathogenic PSN1 mutation in AD. Next, you will hear about the variants specific to autosomal dominant AD versus sporadic AD. The paper is titled Amyloid, Tau, and Astrocyte Pathology in Autosomal Dominant Alzheimer's Disease Variants, ABP Park, and PSEN 1DE9. It was published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry and was written by first author Lemoyne and last author Nordberg. 
the authors seek to establish a pathological profile for ABP Park and PSEN1 Delta E9 mutations. They look at amyloid beta aggregates, tau accumulation, and astrocytes activity. For these three parameters, they compare results from large frozen hemisphere autoradiography, brain homogenate binding assays, and immunostaining. They find a positive association between amyloid beta fibril and tau deposition in the ABP PAR carriers, but not in the PSN1 delta E9 carriers or in subjects with sporadic AD. The authors suggest that this should further be explored in vivo so as to better understand the pathways responsible for these pathological differences between AD and variants. The next paper in this category is titled The Alzheimer's Disease Causing Presenilin 1 L435F Mutation Causes Increased Production of Soluble AB43 Species in Patient-Derived iPSC Neurons Closely Mimicking Matched Patient Brain Tissue. It was published in the Journal of Neuropathology and Experimental Neurology, written by first author Oakley and last author Frosch. The researchers in this study used human-induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSC-derived neurons. These cells came from an individual with familial AD linked to the PSEN1 L435F mutation. These cells were compared for their biochemical phenotype with brain tissue obtained at autopsy from the same patient. They did this to evaluate the effects of the PSN1 L435F mutation under physiological conditions. They observed that in its heterozygous state, the PSN1 L435 mutation caused a large increase in soluble AB43 but did not change soluble AB40 or AB42 levels when compared with control iPSE neurons. They also observed increased phosphorylated tau species in PSN1 mutant iPSE neurons. They saw consistent changes in amyloid beta in the autopsy of brain tissue from the same patient as well. Finally, when they evaluated the feasibility of using amyloid beta-43 immunohistochemistry to identify familial AD cases, they found that strong amyloid beta-43 staining occurred only in familial AD cases. Up next are papers related to APOE studies. We have about seven papers within this section. Here, the first paper published in the journal Sire Reports is titled Short-term memory advantage for brief durations in human APOE epsilon-4 carriers. The first author is Zokai and the last author is Hussain. Apolipoprotein E or APOE epsilon-4 gene allele is the highest known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It has been well conserved in human beings and has a possible reason why is explained by the antagonistic pleiotropy theory. According to this theory, variants of harmful genes such as APOE epsilon 4, which confers a disadvantage later in life, might provide rather an advantage earlier in life, hence ensuring its survival. This is in line with previous studies which have shown that the epsilon 4 allele might have a pleiotrophic effect in short-term memory. In this paper, the researchers tested short-term memory performance in 1,277 individuals. 959 of them included carriers and non-carriers of the APOE epsilon 4 gene, those at highest risks of developing AD. They found that individuals carrying the gene showed a significant memory advantage irrespective of age, specifically for brief retention periods, but not for longer durations. They conclude that the gene has a strong antagonistic pleiotropy effect on cognitive functions and could explain the survival of the APOE epsilon-4 allele in the gene pool. The title of the next paper is APOE epsilon-4 shapes the cerebral organization in cognitively intact individuals as reflected by structural gray matter networks. The first and last authors are Casaglia and Gisper respectively, an ALFA study. The paper was published in the journal Cerebral Cortex. In this paper, the author studied the effect of APOE, Epsilon-4 and Gray Matter Networks, GMN for short, in a large sample of cognitively unimpaired individuals at a high genetic risk of AD. 
they used independent component analysis to find sources of structural covariance and analyzed APOE group differences within and between networks. They found that, compared with non-carriers and heterozygotes, APOE epsilon-4 homozygotes showed increased covariance in one of the networks. This includes the right, lateralized, parietal, inferior frontal, and inferior and middle temporal regions. They repeated the same analysis on a subsample of amyloid negative subjects and obtained the same results. Between networks, they saw that APOE epsilon-4 carriers showed reduced covariance and included the frontal and temporal regions, which are targets of amyloid deposition. Based on these findings, they concluded that structural effects in the APOE epsilon-4 associated neuronal networks may be an early event in AD pathogenesis, possibly even upstream of amyloid deposition. Up next in this category is a paper titled APOE Epsilon Allele Accelerates Age-Related Multicognitive Decline and White Matter Damage in Non-Demented Elderly. This paper was published in the journal Aging. Their first and last authors are Sun and Zhang respectively. Here, the researchers examined the joint effect of APOE Epsilon for allele and age on brain, white matter, integrity and cognition. They assessed the age-related variation in cognition and in white matter tract between non-demented elderly, epsilon-4 carriers, and non-carriers. There were a lot of findings that I can't go over in this summary. Here are some of their findings, however. Carriers showed a steep age-related decline after age 50 in general mental status, attention, language, and executive function, but overall, carriers perform worse than non-carriers at almost all ages. They also observed that age as a risk factor mainly affected the anterior fibers, while APOE epsilon-4 carriership affected posterior fibers, and the integrative effect of age and APOE epsilon-4 was seen on both anterior and posterior fibers. Based on their findings, they concluded that combining APOE status with age might give more insight into AD's disease development. The title of the next paper is Apolipoprotein E4 disrupts the neuroprotective action of sortilin in neuronal lipid metabolism and endocannabinoid signaling. It was published in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia by first author Asaro and last author Wilnau. In this study, the researchers look at the neuronal apolipoprotein E receptor sortilin. They are interested in understanding the role it plays in brain lipid metabolism and its relevance to Alzheimer's disease. When bound by lipid carrier APOE, the receptor sortilin mediates the uptake of cargo into neurons. To understand the significance of this uptake route, the researchers combined neurolipidomics data in patient specimens with fundamental studies in mouse models. They identified APOE isoform specific functions for sortilin. They found that sortilin converted polyunsaturated fatty acids into endocannabinoids lipid-based neurotransmitters which sustain neuroprotective gene expression in the brain. They observed that this sortilin function required APOE3 but was disrupted by APOE4. This compromised the neuronal endocannabinoid metabolism and action. Next up is a paper titled Predictors of Rate of Cognitive Decline in Patients with Amnestic Mild Cognitive Impairment. The paper published in the journal Clinical Neuropsychology was written by first author Serbonne and last author York. This study examined predictors of the rate of cognitive decline in subjects with amnestic mild cognitive impairment, or MCI for short, a known risk factor for conversion to AD. The researchers assessed various predictors including age, genetic vulnerability, baseline cognitive performance, and baseline neuropsychiatric severity. Their results suggested that carriers of the APOE epsilon-4 allele decline more quickly compared to non-carriers. They also found that participants with lower executive and cognitive function at baseline predicted faster decline on dementia severity measures. Surprisingly, they also observed that people with lower depression levels decline more rapidly on dementia severity measures compared to those with higher levels of depression. Finally, they concluded that future studies on predictors could aid in delaying conversion to AD. 
Up next in this category is the paper titled APP induced patterned neurodegeneration exacerbated by APOE4 in C elegans. This was published in the journal Genes Genomes Genetics by first author Seeley and last author Pierce. In this study, the authors used the nematode C elegans to model age-related pattern neurodegeneration seen in AD. This effect was exacerbated by APOE4, which along with APP is an important modifier in AD. It is also important to note that compared to other APOE variants, APOE2 and APOE3, APOE4 as well, hastens and worsens early and late onset forms of AD. Using this model, they found that APOE4 acted with APP to increase cholinergic neurodegeneration caused by APP. They further suggested that this model can be used to understand how APP and APOE4 act together to cause neurodegeneration of some neurons while leaving others unaffected. The last paper within this section is titled Motor Cortex Function in APOE4 Carriers and Non-Carriers. It was written by first and last authors Yasen and Christy respectively and was published in the journal Clinical Neurophysiology. The aim of this study was to see if there was a difference in motor cortex function between APOE4 carriers and non-carriers. The authors measured motor cortex excitability and inhibition using transcranial magnetic stimulation and obtained measures of glutamate and gamma aminobutyric acid concentrations using proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They observed no significant differences in transcranial magnetic stimulation or proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy measures between carriers and non-carriers. Based on these findings, they concluded that the motor cortex function was similar between apolipoprotein E4 carriers and non-carriers. Next, we have two papers examining amyloid beta-related mutations. The title of the first paper is Cerebral Amyloid Angiopathy Linked Beta Amyloid Mutations Promote Cerebral Fibrin Deposits Via Increased Binding Affinity for Fibrinogen. It was published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The first and last authors of the papers are Kaja Marka and An. In this study, the authors looked at the role of beta amyloid fibrinogen interactions in hereditary cerebral amyloid angiopathy or HCAA pathology. HCAA is a rare familial disease in which mutations within the beta amyloid peptide causes an unusual increase in vascular deposits and subsequent cerebrovascular damage in AD patients. The study results revealed that the common forms of HCCA-linked mutations, Dutch and Iowa mutations, resulted in up to 50-fold stronger binding affinity of amyloid beta for fibrinogen. They also showed that the stronger interaction between fibrinogen and mutant beta and amyloid peptides lead to disturbed clot structure and delayed fibrinolysis. They validated these results using immunofluorescence analysis of the occipital cortex. Compared to early onset AD patients and non-demented individuals, they found that HCAA patients showed increased levels of fibrinogen, amyloid beta codeposition, and fibrin deposits. They concluded that HCAA type Dutch and Iowa mutations increase amyloid beta fibrinogen interaction and contribute to the observed HCAA pathology. Next is a paper by first author Radko and last author Makarov. The title of this paper is English H6R mutation of the Alzheimer's disease amyloid beta peptide modulates its zinc induced aggregation. It was published in the journal Biomolecules. In this paper, the authors studied the effects of zinc ions on the aggregation of amyloid beta-42 peptide and its mutated isoform H6R amyloid beta-42. This mutated isoform is formed by a histidine to arginine substitution at position 6 of the amyloid beta sequence and causes early onset AD. To study its zinc-induced aggregation, the authors used circular dichroism spectroscopy, dynamic light scattering, turbidometric and sedimentation methods, and bis-ANS and thioflavin T fluorescence assays. They found that zinc ions induced the formation of amorphous aggregates for both amyloid beta-42 and H6R amyloid beta-42 peptides, but with distinct optical properties. They also found that upon complexing with zinc ions, 
the amyloid beta 42 peptide showed an increase in the random coil and beta sheet st structure while the H6R amyloid beta 42 peptide show no notable structural changes. Our next category is novel variants and in this category we have about four papers. The title of the first paper is Association between common variants in RBFOX1, an RNA binding protein, and brain amyloidosis in early and preclinical Alzheimer's disease. This paper was published in the journal JAMA Neurology with first author Raghavan and last author Bayux. The objective of this study is to examine the underlying genetic basis for brain amyloidosis in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. First, the authors conducted a meta-analysis on genetic and imaging data from six multicenter cohort studies of healthy older individuals and those with Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. Then, they validated genetic observations using pathologic and clinical data. They included participants over the age of 50 with amyloid positron emission tomography imaging data and DNA. Based on their study, they identified RBFOX1 to be a novel locus for amyloidosis. The RBFOX1 protein localized around plaques and reduced expression of RBFOX1 was correlated with higher amyloid beta burden and worse cognition and may thus have a role in AD pathogenesis. Next is a paper titled Imaging Genomics Discovery of a New Risk Variant for Alzheimer's Disease in the Postsynaptic Sharpen Gene. The first author is Soheli Nezhad and the last author is Zarai. The paper was published in the journal Human Brain Mapping. The main aim of this paper was to identify brain regions that are most vulnerable to AD and to further explore genetic variants affecting this critical brain trait using a data-driven search. The researchers performed tensor-based morphometry and independent component analysis and identified the limbic system and its interconnecting white matter as the most AD vulnerable brain feature. They next performed whole genome analysis, which revealed a common variant in Sharpen that was associated with this imaging feature. They found that it was correlated with entorhinal cortical thickness and with parental history of AD. Based on their results, they concluded that the anatomical changes in the limbic system and AD risk are associated with a novel variant in Sharpen. The next paper is titled, COSMC or causal mutations reduce T synthase activity in advanced Alzheimer's disease and was published in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia. The first author is Gala Moody and the last author is La Lazari. It seems like in AD, glycoprotein and TN antigen are found in abnormal levels. To further look into this, the group identified C1GALT1C1 or causal mutations in AD and controls. COSM is an important molecular chaperone required for the activity of T synthase in glycosylation. The group performed real-time quantitative reverse transcription PCR, Western blotting, and T synthase activity assays and identified COSM mutations in the promoter, coding region, and the 3' UTR in AD and normal individuals. They found that these mutations were correlated with AD progression. They also observed that T synthase levels were significantly elevated in advanced AD compared to controls. They found that T synthase activity in advanced AD with causal mu coding mutations was also lower than control. Based on these results, they concluded that these causal coding mutations reduce T synthase activity in advanced AD and potentially cause defective galactosylation. The next paper published in the journal Neurology Genetics is titled Synonymous Variants associated with Alzheimer's disease in multiplex families. The first and last authors are Tang and Reitz. In this study, the authors conducted a whole genome sequencing study on Caribbean Hispanic multiplex families affected by AD and identified synonymous variants in the four following genes. CDH23, SLC9A3R1, RHBDD2, and ITIH2. They found that in comparison to subjects without dementia, expression of CDH23 and SLC9A3R1 were increased, and expression of RHBDD2 increased in individuals with AD at death. In terms of functionality, they observed that the increased CDH23 and decreased RHBDD2 were related to brain amyloid load. Increased SLC9A3R1 
was associated with TDP43 pathology. Using EQTL data, they found that the CDH23 variant was in linkage disequilibrium with variants modulating CDH23 expression levels. Next, using mini-gene splicing assays, they found that the CDH23 and SLC9A3R1 variant affected splicing efficiency. Based on these findings, they concluded that CDH23, SLC9A3R1, RHBDD2, and ITIH2, which are involved in synaptic function, the glutamatergic system, and innate immunity may contribute to increased AD risk. We are near the end of this episode with three ep- papers in the last category, other variants or mutations. The first paper is titled Clinical and Pathologic Phenotypes of LRP10 Variant Carriers with Dementia. Published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, the first and last authors are Berju and Rosemuller. The objective of this study was to search for low-density lipoprotein receptor-related protein 10, or LRP10 in short. This was done in subjects with various neurodegenerative pathologies that included dementia and Lewy pathology at autopsy, or dementia and Parkinsonism without Lewy pathology, but with various other neurodegenerative pathologies. The researchers performed Sanger sequencing and found rare, possibly pathogenic, heterozygous LRP10 variants in three patients, all of whom had a family history of dementia. They concluded that these rare LRP10 variants were present in patients with dementia and different brain pathologies, including dementia with Lewy bodies, mixed Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease, and Alzheimer's disease. If you're interested in the nitty-gritty details, check out the original paper or the abstract for the list of variants. The title of the next paper published in the journal Bioscience Reports is Complement Receptor 1, Genetic Polymorphism, Contributes to Sporadic Alzheimer's Disease Susceptibility in Caucasians, a meta-analysis. It was written by first author Yuan and last author Zhe. The objective of this paper was to understand the association between two complement receptor 1, or CRI gene polymorphisms and sporadic AD risk in Caucasians. For this, The researchers performed a meta-analysis of 18 case control studies. They found a significant statistical difference for both the CRI polymorphs in the dominant and recessive models with both homozygote and heterozygote comparisons. Based on these results, they concluded that the identified CR1 polymorphisms were related to sporadic AD risk and more so in Caucasians. The final paper in this category is titled Lack of association between LGMN and Alzheimer's disease in Southern Han Chinese population. The first author is Zhang and the last author is Liao, published in the journal, the European Journal of Neuroscience. Recent studies have shown that legumane, or LGMN for short, plays an important role in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Cleaves amyloid beta protein precursor and tau promote senile plaques and the formation of neurofibrillate tangles. Its exact genetic role in the development of AD is still unknown. The authors of this paper used Sanger sequencing to study the effects of legumane gene variants in a cohort from South China. They performed a single variant association test to study the single independent effect of legumane on AD and found none of the common variants in legumane to be statistically significant. Next, they performed a gene-based association test to study the cumulative effect of legumane on AD. This analysis also showed no association with AD. Based on these findings and the results of their replication study in the AD Neuroimaging Initiative cohort, the authors concluded that legumane gene may not be a critical factor in AD pathogenesis. This brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for tuning in. That's it for this episode. A huge thank you to the team that is working on sorting, summarizing, and scripting these abstracts as well as the operations behind Aminder. The music is from Journey of a New Transmitter by Anusha Kamesh, musician and fellow scientist, and now a member of the Aminder team. You can find the original piece and her other music on SoundCloud under Anusha Kamesh or on her YouTube channel, AK Music. Interested in joining the team? Give us a shout! We can always use help with content development, podcast editing, advertising, and you can be part of a new and exciting venture. Reach us by email at aminderpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. Oh, we're also on Facebook now. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list if you want access to the bibliography for each of our episodes. The references come with timestamps. Hmm, timestamps. So you can more easily locate the paper that caught your interest. Check our notes below for details on how to sign up. And very close to this, you'll also find a link to our feedback survey. Because, yeah, your feedback matters to us. So please, pretty please, let us know how we can make this podcast a better tool for you. And last but not least, thank you for tuning in with us. And on this note, we hope you found our podcast useful and accessible. Until next time.